question for Robert mainly. Um, so I just wondered, with your poetry, if you came from a spoken word background or if you actually perform your poems sort of yourself in person as well. Yeah. And then also about the fire ceremonies, you, you, or the fire uh -huh. poetry, you mentioned a ceremonial element to them. And I was just yeah. quite curious as to what that was. That's a good question. Um, I don't come from a, a, a poetry background. I come from an art school background. I studied painting at Edinburgh. I did a MFA at Edinburgh too. And then I went away to America to be the artist in residence at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And I did, therefore, sort of eight years of art school education and was showing a lot in galleries and sort of contemporary art spaces and felt a bit frustrated by the limitation of audience that I had. So I started working in the streets in about 2004 with the billboard pieces. And the, the poetic element of the billboard pieces was kind of to do with a private passion for modernist poetry and the thought that I could take the way that Jenny Holzer, I'm not the first text artist to use billboards, Jenny Holzer did it in the 1980s, but I thought I could use that billboard space for a kind of voice that was a step closer towards poetry, let's say. Um, I mean, poetry sort of caught up with me in a sense, and I've now started with my girlfriend, who's a poet, Greta Bella Machina, um, a poetry press called New River Press, which uh, publishes, let's say, radical contemporary British poetry, and we publish our own poems, and we publish uh, the work of Heathcote Williams and Niall McDevitt, Simon Drake and Rosalind Janna. So we have seven books out now, and you can find that at thenewriverpress.com if you're interested. Plug. Huh? Plug. plug. Thenewriverpress.com. Nice. Yeah, that's it. Um, so the spoken word thing, I mean, we perform with the books and that little group of poets a little bit but it's something that I almost don't feel naturally comfortable with. And I might have started doing billboard poems because I hated reading poems, but now I've been sort of forced to read them sometimes, I think, is the answer. Cool. We've got another question. Just down here, this gentleman. Come across. Uh -huh. Does this work? Not press the button. On the Hello. There you go. Oh, that works. Okay. Um, I had another question for, for Robert, actually. Um, you mentioned that you, in the beginning, started doing things, the billboard takeovers, mainly illegally, and then started at, in LA, had this encounter where you were able to put them up legally through the collaboration between the gallery and Clear Channel. And I was wondering, what did that mean for you in terms of experience? Like, What did that mean to put those billboards up? You mentioned you found it's a, there's a certain irony to it. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the experience of that and what that meant for yeah. your work having been, putting, been put up legally and not illegally. Well, I was never stopped by the police in LA and thrown into the back of a police van and questioned for an hour, um, which I was in London. So um, it was a gentler experience all around. But I mean, I think the question there would be, does it change the content and meaning of the work? Um, I'm not sure is the answer to that. Um, I think... I want to change the type of speech you get in those spaces. Um, I don't think that with the work that was unauthorized that I did, there was ever any complaints by people because people are happier to have a poem on their street than another ad for Diet Coke. I mean, we know Diet Coke is fizzy. Um, you know, we told that like a hundred times a week. Um, so, so more generally, I think for me, it's about opening up the the type of language that you get in those spaces and also the language that I use is intentionally vulnerable sometimes. Like I sometimes write in the first person so you feel a sort of sense of intimate heartbreak or something and I think that that's therapeutic for me and, and can be therapeutic also for the audience, hopefully. Grab the mic. Yeah, I'm kind of leading on from the illegal thing there. Um, I think... And this goes back to the stereotypes as well. I think there's that... Because there is... When I, when I see, like, a, I mean, a graph piece is slightly different to maybe a street art piece, but when I see a graph piece, especially when it's in New York and it's a massive roller piece that's been done over the edge of a, a rooftop, I kind of have the appreciation, and the piece kind of means that much more to me because I kind of know the, the, the sort of lengths they went to get there. And 
I think that is kind of a little issue because I think, like in my mind, even though I'd, I'd, I don't wouldn't want to intentionally do it, subconsciously I appreciate a piece that has been illegally done more than one that has been legally done. But I mean, the, the creative process is still there. It's just it's a different way of doing it. But weirdly, because of how I've grown up and how I've always I grew up on graffiti before I grew up on street art. It's kind of, I, I just ha naturally have that mentality of like, oh, that's illegal. And then I can kind of see, oh, how did he get up there? And then how did he climb up there? And then uh, sort of, yeah, it kind of does validate a piece in a different way for me. Um, I'm not saying that's right, but it does happen. It seems to be kind of, it's come up a few times, you know, the idea of actually kind of what Banksy wrote on that thing. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And most of the speakers that have been speaking have come, and it seems that the more authentic work seems to have come from just doing it rather than going through legal channels. Is there a degree of more authenticity in taking rather than requesting? I, I personally think that actually... It, it's because it's that struggle I think that gives the authenticity. It's the same as I think happens with with rap artists. There's this like desire and and dream to be as big as you can in your field and do what you can. So there's there's this energy, there's this energy that you portray in your work, and then as soon as you kind of do, kind of make it, you, there's kind of this emptiness. So they the people can't. I think people do generally like put their feet off the pedal a little bit. Mm. It's because it's just like well. I kind of can do what I want, whatever I put out, someone's going to buy it, someone's going to like it. So there's, I think people themselves lose that energy because they've got to a point where they can just go and paint a wall because of who they are. So they don't really have to say much. I mean, I, last year, made a, a really big valid point when um, he was flown out to New York and he, he got given two huge walls and no one could get a wall for love nor money then. Um, all he did was go there and paint it black. Mm. And that's all he did. And then, and then the guy was, oh, you're coming to paint? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'm coming to paint the next day. And then got on a plane to San Francisco and just left. And just left it. But his argument anyway was that he wanted, he was just like, well, I can do what I want. And he goes, this is just kind of shows I can do what I want. And also he was like, I'll paint a blank canvas because I know it's going to get tagged by some little youth. And I want them to have that ability to do that. Mm. So, but it's kind of funny to see how he's got that to the point of that, uh, of his career where he can Kind of do you that. You can get away with it. You can get away with it, yeah. Anybody else want to elaborate on illegal, legal, authentic? Um, I suppose, yeah, for me, like the f initial idea of um, buying the stuff and making the signs from scratch, it actually became so much more relevant to my particular project to take the stuff and, and use the materials that I found. And that was because actually I haven't got a lot of money to spend on that project as well. It was like limitation of resources, which added to the idea and, you know, did make it slightly more authentic, I think. Cool. We got any other questions? Uh, go right behind you, directly behind you. If you want to stand up. There we go. Hi. Um, sorry, this uh, is to you, Robert. Um, I was interested in what you were saying about um, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction and how, um, uh, just your slide where you said that he was wrong about the aura. Um, so he was actually a, a massive socialist and he loved the fact that works of art were being reproduced. Um, and it was like a really seminal text like, and a lot of artists have responded to the fact that he was pro. Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's like pro-reproduction. And I just wonder whether um, maybe that changes the way that you think about your art, knowing that it's um, situated in that art historical context? Um, I mean, it changes the way I think about the internet, because I, I do think that Benjamin Text is seminal and very important and gives us perspective to look at now through the lens of the beginning of modernism. And um, I love his writing, and I think, um, you know, you have to, you can't be afraid of new media, you have to not mytho mythologize the internet. I think it's mythologized and it's sort of constantly talked about these days. People say words like algorithms and that's meant to make us sort of like shut down deconstructing what the internet is and it's meant to make us just receive it as sort of passive consumers. And it's increasingly become a, a vehicle for selling and consumption. And I think that if you look back at, to someone like Benjamin, it teaches you to not be afraid of new media and sort of take, take a sort of brave stance almost. I don't know. Um, yeah. Cool. I mean, it's not related. 
really relate, but just kind of talking about the internet, um, I just think something like that was inevitable anyway, because I know we, I've spoken about before how we've evolved as, as a race through stories, but that, that is what we, what also is, is the rate of communication. You know, things were passed down for a message over a horse across country, pass a message. And the quicker, the quicker you can get information, the quicker we can evolve and succeed uh, in evolution. So it's, it's, it's a really important tool. Question? Uh, that is a very high hand from, I think it's me or down there. Yeah. You could just stand up, please. Well, I can stand up, yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think I need it. Oh, I, it would be good for the, so for the, for the filming if you could use it. Okay. I will use Thank it. Thank you. Uh, Robert Montgomery, uh, I'm, curious, um, I'm curious about your creative process. Is it, what comes first? Is it the, the poem or the place? It's a good question. Um, the answer is sometimes the poem, sometimes the place. Um, I started doing the work from notebooks that I would keep in my pocket and sort of write on the bus. And then when I started doing the billboard work, I sort of, in the end, started writing the poems in the graphic design software, which is Illustrator, and trying to take the perspective, um, a graphic perspective on the, te on the text, looking to a tradition of concrete poetry that's gone on in the 20th century, um, started by people like Guillaume Apollinaire in France and um, Wyndham Lewis in England, who started a sort of English concrete poetry in 1915. And so I started to write those in the Illustrator software, and so now the process is both a poetic and graphic process at the same time. And then I'll often write for... I'm aware that I try to write about the city as a phenomenon, as an archetype in a sense, and those texts can always be in any city. But if I have a project in a city, I might often write for that city. So with the LA billboards that I showed you but didn't read, in the presentation, I tried. I wrote in in a more American English, and I tried to imagine uh, that I lived in LA and sort of had the experience of the psychogeography of LA, and so I want to sort of connect with the place that way. Um, so in those cases where it's a project in a city and I travel, I'll try to visit the city first and connect psych psych psychologically with with that place in some way. Um, does that answer the question? Has it ever happened that you have seen a place and then you wrote the poem afterwards? Or you designed it for the place? Yeah, that, with, with that Tempelhof project that I showed in Berlin, I, I'd fallen in love with that site because I thought that site, which had been um, uh, a Nazi airport and then an American Cold War airbase, I thought that that site somehow catalogued the sort of horrors and mistakes of the 20th century. I felt like Tempelhof was almost a library of our mistakes. And it could be, it could be a really powerful place to write a message about peace. I did billboards, 23 billboards in Berlin that summer also, which sort of celebrated Berlin as the Berlin I see now, which is a very beautiful place of sort of, um, you know, cheap rents for artists. Um, left-wing democracy and a tolerant society that I think is, Berlin's become a very beautiful city if you compare it to its history only, you know, three quarters of a century ago. So um, that was almost like a love poem to Berlin, that project, in a sense. Cool. We do a question down here. Can you stand up for me? Um, so I just wanted to ask um, pretty much everyone, so... Uh, who, what are the sort of artists that are the new artists that you're seeing coming through um, that you're admiring and you're enjoying their work? Um, and I guess that's to everyone. Um, there's a young London artist called David Fryer that I really admire, who's just emerging now out of art school. And he does these very beautiful cityscapes of London's um, skyline in transition. Uh, with sort of celestial explosions above. I'm quite moved by his work. He's called David Fryer. Cool. Um, at the moment, uh, David Bray, I don't know if anyone's heard of David Bray. Um, he's been around a while, but he's kind of 
<clears throat> he's kind of mixed up his his um, his art. He does kind of still life drawings and sketches, but they kind of develop more into paintings and pieces. And he's mixed in wood with it as well, and kind of little detailed of tattoo drawings. Um, I think that's kind of a lot of my influence anyway. Is is, is tattoo when it comes to art? So another artist that I love uh, dearly is is Word to Mother, um, who again a lot of he's a tattoo artist as well. He's done plenty of my tattoos and. Um, a lot of that is incorporated into his work, but it's, it's, I mean, his tattoo work is, I mean, as you can kind of see with that one, is it's kind of not your traditional anyway, so he kind of has his own style, but it's very, he's an, he can class himself as an illustrator, not an artist, and the reason he does that, and I will quote him here, is because he thinks people that use the term artist are wankers. That's his exact. This isn't an emerging artist, but it is someone that I think is really inspirational. It's Grayson Perry. Um, I think he's got political commentary, but he's got the kind of personal narrative as well, uh, like his tapestries, looking at all the tiny little logos all over it and how that is kind of our visual landscape at the moment. He's really looking at society as a whole, looking at us as people um, and reflecting that back to us. I think if you look back at the YBAs, a lot of their work was very inward looking and um, we're starting to see now artists making work which is more outward looking and I think Grayson Perry is a good example of that. Um, one artist who's always inspired me who I talked about in the talk is Bob and Roberta Smith. Um, he's obviously not emerging either um, but I love his aesthetic that it's very immediate and he's so kind of prolific because his um, process allows him to make work so quickly he can respond very quickly to what's going on and again it's that thing of like looking outwards rather than inwards I'm going to finish up, like just oh, no. I know you said emerging uh, yeah I know sorry Thanks, man. <laughs> sorry Doug. Um, my dog's dog socks by the way they are amazing um, or, but these, for, or it, these for Robert well, <laughs> um, but I think a lot of us touched on like artists that kind of already exist and for me personally the reason that I, I say that is because I kind of feel at the moment and it's kind of part of the reason why Spraying Bricks has been a bit slow in the recent months is because i would kind of the, uh, the landscape of like this kind of this type of art has kind of changed, and it's become, for me personally, very oversaturated. It's very, again, like when we're talking about stories, and it's hard to decipher through the shit. Um, and I mean, we're lucky to live in London. It's, 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 people come here all the time and paint, but it's very hard to decipher to, to for me personally what is good and what isn't, and that is purely because of oversaturation. So, yeah. Cool. All right. I think. We'll leave it there. Yeah? Ladies and gentlemen, can you make some noise for Tinsel Edwards, Louis Jensen, and Robert Montgomery? By the way, if you want an illegal magazine, they're in a box just over here if you want to pick one up.